Hello and welcome. We are Tools in the Shed, powered by Cars Guide, ready to rip into car stuff that's caught our eye this week. I'm James and with me are Mal, who will be, uh, he's talking about amazing arrivals at this week's LA show. Stay tuned, everybody. As well as Matt, who will be chiming in with his own take on some critical newcomers from the City of Angels. Yes. And we'll check in with a new, more frank and honest Elon in this week's Must Watch. So stay with us. But first of all, Mal, in La La Land. Kick us off a very important mainstream car for this market and a lot of others being Mazda 3. Yeah. Um, what, do you, what do you make of that? I think it speaks volumes that we're talking about the Mazda 3 ahead of the Porsche 911. Sure. Uh, but if you've seen photos of it, it's pretty hard to, to yeah. disagree with the fact that it's beautiful. Oh, yeah, I and disagree. A bit sexy. You don't think it's beautiful? No. Oh. Okay. There cool. you go. Okay, so <laughs> here we go. Here we go. Ding, ding. Which, which, um, <laughs> which part of the Mazda 3 do you think? Attracts your eye now. What is it that's got you engaged? I, I, I it just looks dramatic. I think okay. for a for a mainstream hatch and the sedan, yeah, has excellent proportions. Yep. I think yeah. it's you know look at BMW 3 Series, which is the the traditional benchmark for sedan proportions. Yeah, um, I think it's uh, adventurous with the thickness of the rear of the C pillar. Yep, um, and it's an extension of this whole. Kodo design thing yeah, that Mazda's had generation. going for, for some time now. And it, it's still unmistakably a Mazda 3, which right, ticks all the boxes, out. I think. Yep. Matt, what, yep. what is it that uh, offends your eyeballs? Well, the adventurous C-pillar. Um, yeah. I think that back pillar on the hatchback is ludicrous. It's <gasps> way too big. It looks slabby from certain angles. And the, the glass house itself is tiny. Yeah. Like... In the back seat, you're going to feel like you're sitting in a cave. Yeah. Right. Uh, Motion sickness, ahoy. Well, yeah, and we've seen it, that's a common thing in a lot of cars these days, that they're not really thinking about Toyota people CHR. in the back seat. Exactly. Uh, and there are other offenders as well. But, yeah, it's just sort of, I agree with you on the sedan, though. I think the sedan is gorgeous. Um, interesting, I've read today that there's only a couple of common body panels between the two Models. Yeah, apparently just the bonnet and the windscreen. Yeah, right. Uh, Which actually harks back to, I remember in the well, it's about early nineties when the three two three Astina arrived. Yeah, the yeah. Pop up headlight job. The sedan version mm-hmm. was totally different. Yeah, there yep. wasn't any shared. Uh, and then they had sort another three two three sedan. They had the Protege. Yes, as well. Yeah. Um, Which was an older generation car, or no, or, no, no it's no. just the the more you know the boring yeah. version for boring people. Mm. Yeah, the sedan looks brilliant, and so its C pillar is more acceptable in terms of uh, considerably um, more acceptable. Yeah. But uh, little things like the different chrome treatment around. So one comes from the top and mm. down, the other one comes from the bottom. Excuse me, mm. the bottom and up in terms of around the window line. It's just it it looks classy, mm. um, and it doesn't look. I think one of the things that it doesn't really look that front wheel drivey, the sedan. Like the two, the length yeah. of the nose yeah. and the six, actually. The length of the nose but, is significant. But the, I'm going to gang up on you here, Matt. I'm with Mal, so, mate. That's fine, you know, that's fine. Bring it. But um, the, I, I like the details in that design are amazing. One of the shots we had up on the website uh, with the news piece about its arrival was the tail lights and these cylindrical little um, yeah. kind of tubes of, of bright light. Yeah. Just beautiful yeah. little design details. So... Understanding what you're saying about a visibility thing, I think as an overall design, it's got a lot going for it. Mm, yeah, we'll have to see. But um, <laughs> look, I'll probably be proved wrong. I'm not a huge fan of the current design language of Mazda 3 okay. anyway. Okay. So, yeah. 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 The the looks are just part of the story, though. Under the skin, it's a completely new car. Good yep. point. Second generation Skyactiv. Yep. Um, a lot of thinking has gone into it. Yeah. Uh, later this year, we're going to see the Skyactiv X engine, uh, which, which is, is a the... petrol compression ignition exactly. uh, engine, which is a, a breakthrough to say the least. So, with yep. a supercharger not using uh, spark plugs for compression at higher RPM, I think, but uh, claimed to deliver the efficiency of a diesel and the torque of a diesel with the power of a petrol. Amazing. Yeah, that'll be great. Running be very exciting. regular 91 unleaded. Yep. Very impressive technology. Yeah. So mainstream yeah. car bringing world first stuff and looking good. So hopefully yep. they've also addressed things like lack of 
rear seat space and yeah. the boot space for the hatchback because that's what's let it down a lot in and recent years. You can only get to grips of that when you actually physically exactly. are you know, driving yep. the car, experiencing it, all that stuff. And they are moving to a torsion beam rear end instead of the independent rear end, which should save space and therefore leave room for more boot and back seat. Mm-hmm. Uh, their argument is that it's for refinement more than anything, but mm-hmm. it's also cheaper. Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> you know, I think cheaper most Cheaper and us, easier to package. Most yeah. buyers would prefer a bigger back seat and a bigger boot. Yeah, yeah. good point. And Renault's proven you can do a lot with a torsion beam yeah. rear end. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. All right. Wow, amazing. So, yeah. Mazda 3. Second cab off the rank, Mal. I'll go to you again mm-hmm. because um, it's it's sort of in your part of the world. You're a big a big Jeep uh, aficionado. We've got one called. <laughs> well, mate, you're the joke. you're the one with the picture of yourself standing on top of a Wrangler in the Rubicon trail or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was there. He's yeah, right. and standing on top of a Jeep. Yeah, okay. Now right this on. one is subtly named. Uh, it's the Gladiator, <laughs> and uh, it's a dual cab Ute, effectively. So yeah. this is something that's been. Longed for, talked about, Teased. finally arrived. We've seen concept versions for yeah. it looks probably two decades now. Suitably yeah. tough, yep. quite big. Yep. Give us uh, give us your thoughts. It's effectively a JL Wrangler, which is an all new car. Yep. With a Ute tray attached to the back and a longer wheelbase again. Yeah. And long will be the the operative word there. Right. It is five point five meters long. That's a that's a big vehicle, isn't it? Yeah. So, so does that mean you can have your dual cab space and also have a decent tray? I suppose because yep. often the compromise with a dual cab isn't it that you you get all your people in and then ironically you don't have a lot of load space out mm. the back. And the Wrangler Ultimate, uh, the four door wagon, uh, already the back seat is kind of what a dual cab you yeah. gets anyway. So they can't afford to lose any, really. But Clearly, for American buyers, they need a decent tray length. Yes. Uh, yeah. And so you need extra wheelbase and extra rear yes. overhang for that. Yeah. Not sure what it's going to mean for its off-road capability. It'll mm. be really stable on a on a steep climb, mm. but uh, that ramp over angle can't be too impressive. No. Um, yeah. Good point. At also, length, it's the wheelbase is immense. And yeah. with a solid front axle, imagine what the turning circle's going to yeah. be like. The <laughs> geometry of the, the whole thing looks a little bit challenged. Uh, and I think that... The, the fact that it's got such a long wheelbase, and it is that long, 5.5 metres, so it's longer than a Ford Ranger Wild Track. By more than 10 centimetres. Yeah. And Which is long. That's, that's a lot. But it doesn't, to my eye, it doesn't pull off its proportions very well at all. Yeah. It looks really awkwardly long. It a bit does. like an aftermarket uh, VS Commodore ambulance unit. I, th- I, yeah. think, I think with the, with the car... <laughs> Look it up. You were talking about turning circle. I think with the car, you get a couple of little scooters to act as like bow thrusters <laughs> to help you just edge it into a car park rather than <laughs> having to good. actually turn it. But Maybe it's got m- rear steering. The first, yeah. the first thought that occurred to me was that if you're looking for a work truck Mm -hmm. and you want to make a different decision to the usual suspects like a Ranger or a Hilux, this would be perfect because it doesn't say I've spent an obscene amount of money like Mm -hmm. an X-Class Merc, um, but it says I've gone for something different, it's tough, it's kind of a working vehicle. I think it would have a lot of appeal. And theoretically it should tow well. Yeah. You know, the US rating's three and a half tonnes. That doesn't mean ours will, but it's, you know... Wheelbase equals towing stability generally. Sure. Uh, and we love to tow. I'm really looking forward to, you know, at some stage, trying to get to Groups with mm. Now, that's the question. For Australia, um, do we, we know? It. We are getting it. So they that's won't fantastic. confirm when. Uh-huh. Uh, likely to be towards the end of next year. It can't be much longer. End mm. of 2019. Because we don't get the regular jail wrangler until about mid, mid-year next year, which right. is long enough. Yep. Uh, but we are getting it. What is also unclear is what engines we'll get. That's what I was going to say. So, There's talk of the 3-litre V6, but that's only being produced for left-hand drive markets, Yep. which leaves us with the petrol V6, the 3.5-litre, which is a good engine, yeah. but will likely be pretty thirsty with the extra weight yeah. of yeah. Uh, of the Gladiator, and the 2.2-litre turbo diesel, which we expect to get as well. Fine. Sounds a bit meagre for a car of that size, but... I hate to mention the Ranger 2 litre again. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. It's and possible. there are plenty of other utes with small engines. Yeah. yeah. You just got to recalibrate your brain. Exactly. Uh, it's it's not about capacity anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but a Hemi V8 under that would look That'd really be right. Yeah. There's also talk of the Hemi V8 yeah. joining well, after, later, yes. which, you know. After it's been engineered for the Renegade. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which which would be a, the only light commercial V8 ute for yeah. Yeah, Australia. Right. Yeah, and again, so that would give it another point of difference. I, yeah. Yeah, I think it could be really interesting. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right, so then sticking with LA, uh, a big arrival for sports car enthusiasts and Porsche files the world over is a new generation 911. 
Now, to my eyes, it looks a lot like the one that's just left, and that's the whole deal. <laughs> you know, yeah. 9-11s are a slow and subtle evolution over time. Um, the back of this one is probably the most distinct change from yeah. the 991 series that precedes it. This has been imaginatively titled the 992 uh, <laughs> series 911, but it's it's a bit bigger, a bit it's a lot wider. Um, I, I think this car is as wide as the all-wheel drive yep. uh, versions of the 991. And no longer do you get a wider body for the turbo or the uh, right. all-wheel drive. It's already out there. So They're one one all... wide body for all, which means they all look kind of tough. Yeah. yeah. But it also means that it's going to be even harder to discern the differences between yeah. low and high spec models. Sure. And if you're a buyer of on one of bench. those cars, you might be a bit upset about that yeah. because you yeah. it's a status symbol to have the extra width, yep. yeah. girth. Yes, we won't go any further. Let's go with width. Yeah. But yeah, um, I, I, I mean, I'm the same as you, James. Like, I understand that it's the slow progression of design over time mm. and and the fact that they have kept this iconic silhouette and this it works for them beautiful face and the the new rear end treatment i'm not so sure about i think it's like we said before it's one of those things you need to see in person yep. to see if you like I it i love or not. the full width light yeah, I love the drama of it. It's a very well Volkswagen group seems to be doing that across yeah. everything at the yeah. moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. making everything look wider from the rear, mm. and it already looks wide. So mm. imagine what it would look like if it didn't have that. Yes. Um, but yeah, I, I'm sort of I love the look of it, and I'd love to be able to drive one. And you know, by all accounts, it's a new 911, so it should be better in every possible way. Mm. But and, I think the thing is, when you stack it up over these various iterations. Mm friend of mine has a first gen uh, 901 series 911 you know, late 60s car we put photographed it with a 991 and the 991 just looks immense yeah, yeah. the the original 911 looks like a delicate little tiny tiny car yeah this is bigger again yeah it, you just have to get your head around a 911 it being this needs big to be though yeah. To fit all the safety, all the and technology. Yeah. And to have the, the dynamic capability as well. Yeah. You need I, that track. I understand that. I'm not, not arguing that for a second. Yeah, okay. All I'm saying is yeah. that it is now a much different proposition um, than mm. it was back in the day when, yeah. it, when it kicked off. It's yep. a bigger car. Yep. Um, it's something that you're putting it up next to a Lamborghini Huracan. You know, it's, it's of that kind of, um, mm. in that category. With this change, though, I think it's fair to summarise it by saying it's like the changes between 996 and 997. You know, under the skin, it's yeah, largely the same, true. but full of clever little tweaks that have made it an overall better package. Isn't it funny how enamoured we all are by the Porsche 911? It's like, it's the car. It's the one that everyone wishes they had. It's one of the great constants of life, though, as well. <laughs> Automated it is. life. But, I mean, <laughs> the lucky few. That creating a new constantly. one, it, there's so much, um, so here's the P word, there's so much passion for 911 yeah. mm. uh, around the world that the responsibility of designing and engineering a new one weighs heavily on the people that do it. So yeah. they take it very seriously. Um, and it's, um, to say the least, well thought through um, yeah. before it ever gets to market. So it'll be fascinating to see it once uh, it actually gets on the ground here. Due here next year, correct? Yeah, yeah. that's right. Can't wait. Yeah, can't wait. That'll that'll be fabulous. And then it'll be the trickle of the 20-something models that follow. Yes. <laughs> Here's I, your Carrera. Yeah. Here's your GTS. Yeah. Here's your I Tura. feel for anyone who's just bought a, uh, you know, terrible pity for anyone who's just bought a GT2 RS. Yeah. I don't feel for them at all. <laughs> like It's now the old one, though. Yeah. But, yeah, okay. Yeah. Still a GT2 RS. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so now it's time for a word from our sponsor. Two words from Winton to the 2018 competition. You lose. More thunder this year from the Aussie legend that's taken the performance world by storm. It's a piece of street art honed in a tough neighbourhood. Bathurst. Aero efficiency holds the Winton turbo down, but nothing holds it back. Talk of the devil, the upgraded Redback two-stroke V9 turbo now howls with even more power and is backed up by an even smoother evolution of Winton's own torque tumbler transmission. There's a Winton for every purpose except standing still, and you deserve a car this good. The 2018 Winton Turbo. One look says a lot, one drive says it all. Information not based on facts. Allow six to eight months for delivery. Not intended for highway use. Store in a cool, dry place. Actual results may vary. Do not use if seal is broken. Dry clean only. Keep frozen until ready to use. Remember to dial before you dig. 
All right, so um, of course we all know that the Frosty Five Thousand was having its uh, demo run yeah. at the Newcastle round of the Supercars last weekend. Of course, that was an absolute triumph yeah. um, for all that caught it on the broadcast. I did. I thought it was spectacular. Lots of lateral thinking. Yeah. So Not Frosty sent movement. us a pic for people looking on YouTube. You'll be able to see it. Uh, sadly, Frosty Winterbottom bottom couldn't make the drive. Oh. So, but it, actually, it was an opportunity. It was an historic pairing of Axel Alcock and Wolf Wheeler, uh, great-grandsons of Winton's founders, Ern Alcock and Horry Wheeler, <laughs> stepped up and they jointly drove the car. You can see in the pic there, giving it full full. This wheel. car is evolving in an interesting direction. It is. It's a, it's a fantastic car. So some, Axel, good name. Some, dura- some durability issues yeah. uh, during, during the demo, but the category is looking rock solid for 2019. So wow. keep an eye out. The Frosty 5000. Absolutely fantastic. It's going to be special. So, keeping with LA, Matt, mm-hmm. we've got the Audi e-tron GT concept, which Posh. causes Mal uh, to make strange grunting yeah. noises. I've but been warned not to make it, grunting yeah. noises. It is um, a superbly proportioned and beautifully designed concept car. It looks uh, Muscular. close to yeah. a production-ready oh, kind of deal. What do you reckon? Very, very close. This is going to be Audi's take on the Porsche Taycan, yeah. essentially. Yes. If you look at the roofline, it's all Taycan. Yeah. And yeah. the rear wheel arches and mm. pretty much everything about it. But, geez, Audi's design language just applies beautifully to yeah. the shape of this car. Yeah. Anyone who thought that Audi had started to go boring and safe and mm. bland with their styling? Take a look at this. And, you know, it's going to have all the all the right things to appease the technophiles out there that, that want Audi to push the basket out there when it comes mm. to having high-end tech in their cars. You know, electric, it's going to have heaps of range. It's yes. going to be fantastic to drive, mm. no doubt. It's going to be fast. It's going to have yeah. insane acceleration. And it's going to look really good while mm. it does it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, yeah, like you say, concept, I don't think it's far from reality. No. Well, that's the thing is that sometimes mm. uh, concept is code for this is what's coming. Yeah, the, uh, the in, wing in mirrors the will be so. slightly bigger. The and wheels sometimes concept smaller. is complete fantasy. Yeah. This is very much the former rather than the I latter. am surprised we're seeing this concept before the production take hand, though. Mm. I would have thought that yep. you know, it, it all seems to have been about take hand so far. Yeah. But the thing about um, these newer performance electric cars is they're ready to accept uh, a charge cable as thick as your forearm you know, <laughs> and, and ready to cop very high-powered charge, yep. um, go back to full strength rapidly. So it's advancing that mm. kind of technology mm. at the same time. And it's interesting to see Audi doing a, a sporty five-door coupe-style vehicle in addition to the e-tron SUV. And where else do they go from there? I mean, we spoke last week about R8. Um, do they need something in an yeah. R8-style body when they've yeah. got practical offerings that can yep. package the stuff a bit better because and do the you know if you've got extra length then you yeah. can have extra batteries and it'll balance the weight better with the performance that you well, can get it's so. a bit as you were theorizing matt um having recent your recent experience with r8 do you just let that car finish with dignity yeah. and say okay it's an atmo v10 that's the end of an era brilliant that car's retired yeah. and Unlike all of BMW a sudden hollow future that's yeah. made a yeah. hybrid supercar with the i8 yeah mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's more than trying to, you know, tweak it up to get by on yeah. regs as time goes by. Much more dignified. Just say thank you and sign up. I'd Thanks love to hear service. what Elon's got to say about it, though. Yeah. We may hear shortly. Yeah. I exactly. We'll no doubt here at some point. <laughs> we <laughs> should be worried. Now we've spoken about various cars that are coming here. One that looks dodgy at best. Um, you you wouldn't bet your house on it coming here. Yeah. But it's the Hyundai. Palisade, yeah, which is an enormous, uh, sometimes eight, sometimes seven seat uh, <laughs> SUV. Yep. So I think if it's seven, if it's eight. seven, oh sorry, if it's seven seats, you get rotating captain's chairs in yeah. the middle row. Yep. Um, if it's eight, it's all fixed seating. Yep. But uh, it's like immense, Matt. Tell, yeah. tell us all about it. Well, it looks immense, yes. right? Yeah. But it's not that. Well, it's smaller than a Mazda CX-9. Still. Is it really? Yeah. Okay. And not that much different to a Toyota Kluger. Is okay. the wheelbase longer than the Santa Fe? Yes. Right. So it's longer wheelbase, longer overhang version of the yeah. Santa Fe. Yeah. Right. So it's it's like it's like if you if you dripped 
some magic fluid on top of a Santa Fe and it had an expansion of 25%. Yeah, that's sort of that's it. the idea that they're Because going the pr- for. proportionally, just looking at the images of it, yeah. it causes you to think that it is in, it's got that very deep uh, grill that yep. gives it a kind of yeah. thickness and Truck solidity. Like. Yeah. yeah. And that's going to appeal to the North American market, which is the target market for this vehicle very because so. it's going to be competing over there with things like the GMC Acadia, which mm-hmm. is now sold as the Holden Acadia, and other big truck size SUVs but in America they only call it a mid-sized SUV sure at nearly five meters long wow. and two meters wide yeah, yeah. yeah I'm really glad they're giving the Santa Fe and the Palisade unique names this time around because you know the, the Palisade effectively existed before mm. uh, with the longer Santa Fe that only America and a bit of Europe got mm. um, and our Santa Fe was the five seat Santa Fe in mm. America which yeah. is why our Santa Fe only gets right. proper airbags. So, so as, row. Is, as is so often the case, uh, it's about right-hand or left-hand drive yes. production. Yeah. And at the moment, that's not factored in uh, to the production of this car. Yeah, word that we've got is that it'll be built in Korea alongside vehicles like Tucson and Santa Fe and I-30 and so on. But it's scheduled at the moment only for left-hand drive and specifically tailored for markets such as Korea. Yep. being one of them, yep. and North America, as well yep. as Russia and so on. And Hyundai Australia is champing at the bit to oh, get it. They'd, they'd like to have it here yesterday, right? Yeah, they yeah. can't They can't wait to, to get saying. it yeah. if it will come. Um, because, I mean, Santa Fe in its own right is a really, really good seven-seater. Um, but to have something a little bit bigger to appeal to families that aren't necessarily growing, they're already fully grown, yeah. then it would help a lot for their cause. And our Santa Fe is a full 305 millimetres shorter than the CX-9. Mm. Right. Which is yes, so that's really a it's a category down almost, isn't it? Yeah. If there were such a category, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's it's far smaller than a CX nine than it is bigger than a CRV. Yes. Yeah. So all right. Anyway, so another one that's of interest and is a, a touch and go mm-hmm. uh, for Australia, Matt is Kia Soul. Yeah. So it's a car that that has been here, uh, hasn't copped a lot of love. The, the numbers <laughs> no. have been uh, modest. Uh, yeah. Would be one day, way to put it. But this new one looks. Striking. Oh, it's very different. Yeah. It's, I mean, in the same way that it's very similar. Yeah. Uh, because yeah, yeah. it's got it's got that very uh, identifiable body shape of the soles that have come in the years before, but they've gone quite eccentric with the front and rear styling of this car. Yeah. Um, the front is very linear and and quite square uh, yes. and gone is the tiger nose grill that Peter yeah. Schreier is champion for wow. so many years wow. and at the back there's like this wing style tail light setup which looks like the winglets on the end of a of plane wings um, yes. it's, um, it's they're just as effective from an aero point of view <laughs> no <laughs> doubt yeah so, trails so. vortices off the uh, <laughs> in back of the car chemtrails as you <laughs> speed past yeah. but, it's cool going through a cloud yeah, yeah. and then so it, it's it's an interesting car um, in America it's going to be offered in three different lines so there'll be the X line which will look like a small SUV more than it has in the bit past chunkier. bit chunkier wheel arch guards that sort of stuff um, and then there'll be the GT line which is the sportier looking one if you have a look yep. at our story online it's the red one and then there's the lime green one which is the kia soul ev yeah and it's the chance of coming to australia yeah so surprise surprise kia has said in the past that it really wants to expand uh, and do a electric car program have a few different models offered from 2019 2020 21 um this is one of the cars that apparently could form part of it it makes it makes sense to have this car as part of the lineup because it could appeal to buyers of small SUVs that maybe hadn't considered a Kia Soul yeah. previously. Sure. It makes so much sense. Sure. And if you think about it, it's likely to just be a Hyundai Kona. Well, Soul body. Yeah. Which is, you know, sharing electric bits. Maybe. Potentially. Yeah. And uh, take your point about uh, the looks of the rear end is going to strike people different ways, I suppose. The nose to me says that pioneers like um, the Cherokee from a few years ago that had the very slim, high set. Yeah. Uh, headlights that confronted quite a few people at yeah. the time, that's caught fire. Yeah. You know, there, there are, are a lot of brands now that are doing the deep grill, yep. slim headlights up above, and I think in this car it looks really great. Yeah, it's it's a really common thing, and I also think it has something to do with pedestrian pr- uh, crash protection for Europe. Is there's some reasoning behind the way they're doing these slimline lights? Okay, I've I've heard that at a for Peugeot. visibility. 
Citroen event. So interesting. Anyway, yeah. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. Now, speaking of driving cars, we are going to move to the other part of the shed, just over the wall yep. in the garage here. We've got some cars that we've been driving this week. And uh, first of all, Matt, speaking of larger SUVs, as we were with the Palisade, <laughs> this is a decent-sized family bus. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, what, what have you been steering? The Lexus LX 570S. S. Now, the S is because they probably were smart enough not to call it sports or sport edition. Yeah, or um, even F-sport. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because, you know, that would be a lie. So S is for, <laughs> S is for spacious. It is for spacious. Uh, for anyone not it stands for another video. word as well, but um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not that bad. It is um, a big, large SUV with eight seats. It's based on the Toyota Land Cruiser 200, 200 series, yeah. Yeah. and it has all the hardcore hardware underneath the body. My week with the car was not spent off-road at all. I spent a lot of time just doing the things that you might do in a car of that size, driving to and from work, you know, running around, urban, bit of country road driving. And I was disappointed with it. But, but would it be fair to say, given its heritage or what it's based on, yeah. that if you did take it off highway, oh. it, it would be it would be pretty capable. If you weren't scared of ripping off Chipping the body, rim or, the body yeah, kit. Yeah. To um, me, they seem to be... So it started life looking a lot like the Land Cruiser and through the probably decades since it first appeared, mm -hmm. they've just extended the body kit further and further and further to disguise it Yeah, uh, from, just, the, from the Land Cruiser. But also, it's kind of compromised its off-road ability. Yeah, just over a decade. But, you know, it does still have... Uh, adjustable air suspension so you can raise and lower it yep. if you need to. Can you bounce the front of it at the lights? No. No. <laughs> I tried. Oh, how I tried. No. Um, and it, Might it, take an aftermarket override that. Yeah. yeah. It's also got some really interesting things. Like, have you heard of the Shimamoku Grey trim that uh, Lexus involves in some of its cars? No. Shimamoku is like a process where they will have, uh, they'll use real wood and refine it to the point over 38 days that that's when they'll get... Where it becomes that's, carbon fiber. It's a long it, time in the slow cooker. It becomes a steering wheel after 38 Eight days, days of Japanese hand craftsmanship. Right, because carbon fiber is too easy to form these days. Wow. So, <laughs> well, that's, that is just quintessentially and, and Japanese, Japanese labor is yeah. cheap. That, that kind of thing. Not. And if, if you look at it and you go, yeah, it's wood grain, so what? Right. Uh, but then if you think about that, you realise just how much care and intricacy Lexus that, has it's, for its cars. It's kind of like pub ammo, but in this case, it'd be country club ammo. You know, you yeah. you pull into the car park and say, yeah, see that steering wheel? Yeah. You know how long it took to make that? Yeah. 38 days. Yeah. You know, that, it's that kind of stuff. Yeah. Take your wedding ring off. Is that worth, <laughs> is that worth paying $170,000 or near enough? Right, for some people. 170 is it up to? Yeah. Gee whiz. Yeah, it's expensive. All right, so an SUV for less money than that, Mel, is yep. one you've been living with for some time. Back on Cars Guide brand. Fill us in. Uh, I'm now four months and about 8,000 kilometres into my long-term test of the Hyundai Santa Fe Elite, yep. which is the second from the top model uh -huh. and the one mm. Richard picked as his sweet spot from the Australian mm. launch. Yep. Uh, Matt drove it in Korea on its initial launch. It's good. Uh, it's no longer the newest large SUV on the on the market, but it's probably the most exciting still next to the Acadia. It yeah. looks great. i, I got to say, I'll put my hand up. I think yeah. it looks terrific. So you it's don't like the look of the Palisade, but you do like the look of the Santa Oh, I didn't. I don't think I said I don't like the Palisade. Okay. All right. Mate, you're <laughs> Sorry. the accusations <laughs> really nearly here. Putting words in his mouth. I don't know, Laura, I should go you. What sort of journalist am I? But it does have that tw that <laughs> twin, <laughs> the Santa Fe? twin light thing that it's we were talking It's not just twin about. lights. I think it's like five different levels of lights. Yeah. Which you can read all about in my story. Appropriate to Christmas. That's good. <laughs> Five levels. So, so how would you uh, summarise these four months? Has it been good, bad, indifferent? So for us, it's the first time we've gone beyond a mid-size SUV. And it's it's a good way to do it because it's probably the smallest of the large SUVs. But um, it's as I said before, it's quite close in size to the CRV, which is very much a mid-sizer. Uh, so it's not that different to a CRV, but... Costs a little bit heavier. Okay. Uh, you do get the seven seats, but um, one big one big learning we've uh, had is that you you can't use the back seats. Really, the third row when you've got two child seats fitted. Sure. Because you can't get you in. You can't there. fold the seats. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But um, handy to have them there in the long term. And um, anything that you've been surprised by? You went in with some preconceptions that have been blown uh, out of the water? It's or a comfortable thing, comfortable? but it's full yep. of clever thinking. Okay. Clever thinking you'd expect to come from the Germans. Um, one. One feature is kind of shared with the Germans, but uh, my favourite things is the rear occupant alert. 
uh, which effectively stops you from locking the car with someone on the back seat. Oh, that's good. Your yep. kids or your yep. dog. Yep. Um, and also the, what do they call it? The side exit alert. Okay. Which uh, is similar to Audi's warning for oncoming traffic, ah. but uh, lets you know if you're about to open your door onto oncoming traffic and can also prevent you from unlocking the back doors. I thought that was especially for the mafia. You know, side exit alert. When you go around the corner, just open the door, shove. Yep, done. <laughs> they call the mafia in Korea? Is there a... Anyway. I don't know. Anyway. That... Full of clever thinking. Fantastic. So you're up to your fourth instalment. So yeah. if people want to follow the uh, progression, uh, they can at carsguide.com.au. JC, what have you been in? I've, I've been in a really interesting car. Again, Hyundai it feels like a bit of a benefit, but it's a really significant car called the Ionic. Ah. So it's a five-seat hatch. It's about the same size as Corolla, Mazda 3, a Golf. It's in that kind of territory. But it offers actually three alternate uh, drivetrains, which yeah. is the really interesting bit. So one of them is a hybrid. The second, So, so in, that in uh, that scenario, it's a petrol engine with an electric motor in support. Then it's a plug-in hybrid, which kind of flips that to have the default mode being EV uh, with the petrol motor kicking in as required. And you also have a full electric version, so electric motor and a whopping big uh, battery under its backside. Mm. Um, and that has a real-world range uh, claimed of about 230 kilometres. So they're each at different price points. They're available in uh, elite and uh, premium, premium yep. uh, levels. And the elite version of the full uh, zero electric zero emissions vehicle is two and a half thousand dollars cheaper than the Renault Zoe, which now makes it the most affordable way into a full electric car wow. in this market. And so, on the surface, it's fair to say this is Hyundai's Prius. Yep. But uh, Toyota's never managed to bring us the plug-in hybrid version. Absolutely of the Prius, right. And we get to see an electric Prius. Yeah. So yeah. To me, to me, it just feels versions. like a very confident move. Like mm. here we go. We have the deep pockets. We've been exploring mm. multiple avenues to look at alternative fuel solutions. And for the time being, we're going to offer you three of them. And also, they're chugging away on hydrogen uh, an and fuel cell and yep. all kinds of things. So, yeah. a very impressive move. And it's the first time we've seen it from a mainstream brand to approach with plug-in and full EV and hybrid. Um, you might have uh, yes. BMW, I think, and Mercedes have plug-ins. And BMW has an electric car as well, the yep. i3. Yep. But uh, to do it at this price point, like yeah. it's aggressive. Yeah. Mitsubishi have done EV with the IMEV and plug-in hybrid True. with the, the Outlander, but they haven't not, done a, not in a the series hybrid like this, and, yeah. and arguably not at the same time. Yeah. So so understandably, uh, they're hoping that a lot of fleet customers will be interested in this car. And they're actually taking a punt and saying that the electric version, the full electric version, will account for 50% at least of sales. So. Yep. It's not about volume. This is very much a, a statement and, yep. and a kind of halo in terms of where the brand's going. They must have been so careful to pair that pricing back too to make them keep them accessible. Too right. Isn't it funny though how hybrid, you know, five years ago hybrid was a bit of a dirty word yeah. essentially in the industry. But now, you know, Toyota Camry hybrid, 50% of yep. all the yeah. Camrys they sell are hybrids and they can't keep up with demand. Yep. And Corolla's just gone 50% hybrid in the model mix as well. Yeah. And this is, I mean... It's it's a sign of the times, obviously, yeah. but it's also a sign of consumer expectations shifting yeah. and, and acceptance. And acceptance. But you're right. You're right on the technology. hybrid. As soon as you hear that whirring noise, you know it's a cab that's about to cut yeah. you off. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, exactly. But also, it, it just plain suits the urban driving that most of us do. Yeah. 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 All, right. all right. Well, that's fantastic. Good wrap up. We now move on to the segment we all know and love as Muskwatch. Okay, so interesting. First of all, Elon is 70% sure he will eventually move to Mars. Is he right? going to heaven after that? Could be. It's a short step. <laughs> okay. So in an interview with Axios, which is a news channel on HBO in the US, uh, this week he said a lot of things, but arguably the biggest news is he's as intent as ever on becoming a Martian. Right. right? So he said... I thought it, he was already one. Quote, it's going to be hard. There's a good chance of death. End quote. <laughs> Um, once you land successfully, you'll be working nonstop to build the base, not much time for leisure. And once you get there, even after doing all this, it's a very harsh environment. So there's a good chance you die there. We think you can come back, 
but we're not sure. Hasn't he seen yeah. that Matt Damon movie though? Oh, that's that a scary sounds like film. The Martian, it's a scary yeah. movie. That's no timeline, he's but on. he's previously said SpaceX could potentially launch a rocket to the Red Planet in 2019. So maybe sooner rather than later. Wow. You know? Wow. I've been listening to this other podcast called The Habitat. Sorry to ah, go off. About off. Mars. Yeah, it's about um, the simulation that was uh, performed in Hawaii in the in a very Martian landscape on top of a volcano. And it, it's just so interesting to hear. Ah. It was a 12-month thing where they you know, had six people and saw how they interacted, saw what sort of tension there was wow. in, in a confined space with... You know, limited resources. The it's same sort you think of we food. can recreate that scenario. Crazy. So it's wow. a social experiment as much as it is a physical challenge. That's, that's yeah. It's about sending people. Yeah. yeah. So people gave up a year of their life to see whether they could survive. But one of the six people would be Elon. Yeah. God. <laughs> Wouldn't that be interesting? He couldn't tweet from Mars, which would be a good thing. <laughs> oh, but... you never know. <laughs> uh, so also, after at least twelve months of dismissing critics who stated the bleeding obvious uh, that Tesla was hemorrhaging cash. And on the brink of oblivion, he admitted again in an Axiom interview that during the earlier days of Model 3 production, the company was, quote, within signal, single digit weeks of death. Wow. Right? So less than 10 weeks, uh, two and a half odd months. So, yeah, the truth will out, and there it is. Yeah. So all that time we were fed lines about, yep, all good, nothing to see here, yeah. move along. They were actually on the precipice. So, oh, wow. um, there Shades you go. of Preston Tucker Isn't there. That Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? So, uh, we'll go on to the very point of all of that, the Bloomberg Model 3 production tracker for this week, 4311, down 197 mm. on last week, uh, the 14th week in a row under 5,000. Um, Elon committed to 6,000 a week by the end of the year, and there are only four weeks to go, and they're not within Cooey of it. So, yeah. it'll be very interesting to see if there's a burst build to get up to six thousand, maybe, maybe Sanders the elves are going to jump in and lend a hand. Yeah, maybe. well, there could be could or, be a lot of workers getting Christmas overtime. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. exactly. Whatever happened to his pledge to avoid uh, social media? Or was that just uh, another? That furphy? seems to have gone completely. Had some time towards off. Mars. He yeah. had an hour off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's what he said. Yeah. It was an indeterminate yeah. period of time. Yeah, I'm right. taking some time off. Yeah. Right, which could have been 20 seconds yeah. or 20 years. He also said this week that everyone should be working 80 to 100 hours a week. Yeah, that's right. Um, and, but he, when he tweeted that, someone he said no one ever achieved anything working a 40-hour week, and someone tweeted back at him saying, except the guy that invented the 40-hour week. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and all he could say in response was, touche. Yeah, um, fair enough. Anyway, look, with that, I do envy those people. we've reached the finish line. Thank you, Mal. Thank you, James. And thank you, Matt. Thank you. And thanks to our producer, Marsden. Listen, calling him dopey would be an insult to all the dopey people. And thank you <laughs> and for listening. And Snow friends. Harsh. Please get in touch and make this a two-way conversation. Thanks to Garth's channel for his recent comment that Holden should rebrand itself as Chevrolet. Mm -hmm. That would allow General Motors to launch Buick, GMC and Cadillac dealerships if they choose. So, you know, you're not the only one out there thinking that, Garth's channel. Mm. Um, so thank you for that feedback. Uh, to have your two bobs worth, search for Cars Guide on Facebook and Instagram and use the hashtag CG Podcast or email us at comments at carsguide.com.au. You can listen to and watch us on YouTube and if you're an iTunes fan, please rate and review us. I hope you can join us next time. Until then, old mate was working on his car and a drop of brake fluid accidentally spilled into his mouth. He was about to spit it out, but just thought, hmm, that actually tastes quite good. So over the coming weeks, he started to sip brake fluid on a fairly regular basis to the point where his friends were worried and said, mate, that can't be good for you. Said, no, don't worry, I can stop any time. <laughs> 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 It doesn't actually taste very good. Oh.